What is up, gamers? I got another book review for y'all, back-to-back book reviews. And today we're going to be reviewing The Hobbit in the Lord of the Rings by J.R.R. Tolkien. Probably one of the most, most well-known, most beloved fantasy novel series. Um, and I got this cool box set here. Shout out to my mom for getting me this for my birthday. Very cool box set. And the uh, spines of the book all, all connect to make a cool little mountain range here. Very nice touch. And yeah, let's get right into this, guys. So the first book, we got The Hobbit. With some cool cover art right there, drawn by Tolkien himself, I believe. The Hobbit tells the story of a hobbit, which is kind of a a very small person, even smaller than like a midget. Um, and we follow Bilbo Baggins, who's a hobbit. And he has some visitors come to his house, Gandalf and these 12 elves, and they go on an epic adventure to um, kill a dragon and steal his treasure. And this book was actually intended for children and sort of young younger audiences, so I'm not really the target audience for this. And that might be why I did not really like this book very much. Yeah, one of the things that uh, made me not really like this book very much is the characters are very one-dimensional. You can probably sum up every character in like one sentence uh, and it'll give you like the whole, their whole personality, um, especially the dwarves. There's like 13 different dwarves, uh, but you don't even have to bother learning their names because pretty much all of them are interchangeable. They don't really do anything that makes them stand out from the rest, um, except for Thorin Oakenshield, who is the like leader of these dwarves. And yeah, same with Bilbo. He's not really that interesting of a character. Gandalf is probably the best character, but again, uh, yeah, didn't what didn't really wasn't enough to make me care about any of these characters. The book also contains some artwork in various pages, and the artwork is pretty. It's not very pretty to look at it's very kind of simple simplistic type art i think done by Tolkien himself and um yeah i think they were useful to kind of visualize some of the the various locations they go to um but other than that they didn't really add much to the story so is the story itself interesting no it's very boring um there's lots of chapters where it's like this chapter could have been like a third as long and still got the same point across very very long drawn out descriptions of their travels he autistically describes like every single path they take you'll read a paragraph and it'll be like oh they went down into this big valley and then they took a left near some bushes and then they took a right near some trees and then there was a fork in the road and they decided to take a left and then he like describes things that just aren't really important and it's not so much just that he's describing the scenery, it's that nothing of value is happening. Nothing interesting is happening at all for very long periods of time in this book. There's also songs in here as well. There's points where they'll kind of break into song and stuff. And some of it I, I enjoyed, but a lot of them, I really struggled to to even read them. A lot of the songs have like weird rhyme schemes and they the syllables don't quite match up. And it was hard for me to kind of make it actually sound like a song while I was reading it in my head. Um, and that's a problem that that is, uh, occurs frequently throughout all the songs, pretty much. I also didn't really like uh, the sort of dragon character, Smog. He, um, he, they never really establish him as a threat. I mean, we do get the backstory that he kind of took over this, this kingdom from all the dwarves and he killed a lot of people. But then when we see him, He's very non-threatening. Um, he dies very quickly from like one arrow. In the movies, it was like some gigantic arrow, special arrow that's supposed to kill Smog. In this book, it's literally just they shoot one arrow at a weak spot and he, he dies. It's very anticlimactic. Another thing I didn't like is there's a lot of like foreshadowing. It's not even just foreshadowing. He'll straight up just tell you what is going to happen. Um, there's a point where like Gandalf leaves them and he's like, oh, but this was not the last time they saw Gandalf and a point where they uh, they leave the, the the eagles, which I have a lot of problems with the eagles. But there's a point where they leave the eagles and then they say like, 
oh, well, the Eagles did return at the very end of the story during the Battle of the Five Armies or whatever. It, he'll just blatantly spoil what's going to happen. It kind of made it so I didn't really feel like there were any stakes because uh, at any point Gandalf or these Eagles could just show up and save the day. I never really felt like the characters were in that much danger especially because Gandalf and the Eagles seem so powerful. They can basically solve any problem uh, very easily. Um, so yeah, I never really felt like the characters were in danger very much at any point through this book. And yes, the Eagles have been heavily criticized as a deus ex machina or whatever. Basically, you know, they just come out of nowhere and save the day. And that does happen at a few points in the book, specifically this one chapter where they're, um, you know, up in trees trying to escape these wolves that are attacking them, and then the eagles just swoop out of nowhere to just fly them away. And that chapter is, is particularly egregious because we didn't even know of the existence of gigantic eagles until that chapter. So it really just feels like Tolkien kind of pulled it out of his ass. But um, yeah, the eagles definitely are a problem. Another thing that kind of is Tolkien pulls out of his ass is these um, birds that can communicate. And that's basically how smog is able to be defeated because uh, one of these birds kind of relays uh, a thing that Bilbo found out about where smog's weak spot is. He has a missing scale on like his shoulder. And the reason that their bard is able to shoot and kill smog is because the bird tells him about the weak point. Again, it's just things that are very kind of convenient that just solve the problems. It feels very kind of unsatisfying. Another point that's very anticlimactic is the, the last battle, the Battle of the Five Armies. It's kind of skipped over because the whole, the, the chapter is from Bilbo's perspective and Bilbo is knocked out like towards the very beginning of the Battle of the Five Armies. So he's just passed out and we skip over the whole battle until he wakes up. Uh, you know, eventually it's kind of described to him what happened, but I don't know, I feel like it would have been more interesting to actually read it as it's happening. So what did I like about The Hobbit here? I like the kind of world that he set up here. There's, it's a very sort of large map and we get to be introduced to all these different kind of races of people, you know, these dwarves and these elves and the orcs. And they're not actually called orcs in this book, they're referred to as goblins. We learn a lot about these different groups of people and their different cultures, and um, it's pretty interesting. It's well fleshed out for a children's book, especially. And also we meet Gollum in this book, who is a very important character later in The Lord of the Rings, which is the sequel. And an interesting fact is that this book, there's actually two versions of the book, because when he initially wrote the book, um, he did not plan for there to be a sequel. Uh, so he didn't, there's not really any indication about the rings, like, corrupting nature in the original version of the book. Gollum is actually kind of a chill guy and just gives the ring to Frodo nicely. Um, but then after he realized he wanted to write the sequel, Lord of the Rings, and have the ring be this corrupting force, he had to sort of remake it to make Gollum a more evil, kind of conniving creature. Uh, and then that's what we get in this version, the second edition version. And yeah, so I thought that was kind of interesting. I did enjoy the chapter with Gollum. It was, you know, kind of spooky, kind of creepy. And yeah, that's basically my thoughts. It blew my mind that they split this tiny book into three different movies for the movies. That is a pretty absurd decision. Uh, and yeah, I did watch the movies for the first time. Uh, while they are better than the book, I would say, they aren't very good because, again, they split had to add so much filler in because the book is so short and splitting it into three movies really did not work. Um, so yeah, so let's go on to The Lord of the Rings. So next we got The Lord of the Rings here, which comprises all these these books here. And one of the first things I, re I learned from reading uh, this first volume here, The Fellowship of the Ring... One of the first things I learned from reading Fellowship of the Ring is that Lord of the Rings is not a trilogy. Technically, it's one novel with six different sections referred to as books. You know, book one, two, three, four, etc. Um, uh, but the publisher split it into three volumes here with two books per volume uh, just because he didn't want it to be absurdly long, I guess. But yeah, so that was kind of an interesting thing. I didn't realize that it's not 
uh, a trilogy. And yeah, you'll notice like if you open the second volume, the pages start in like the 400s because it's meant to be one continuous thing. There's also sort of references to an appendix in this book. It'll Sometimes it'll say like, uh, for more information on the dwarvish language, go to this page in the appendix. But there is no appendix at the end of this book. The appendix is in the, the final volume. So yeah, it, do, it is really kind of written as one uh, one book, really. So yeah, it's a bit confusing, but I thought it was kind of interesting. It kind of reminds me of how Kill Bill is considered by Quentin Tarantino to be one film, even though it was split into two films. And The Lord of the Rings is more adult than The Hobbit. This is more higher level. They also explain in the prologue in this book that these, The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings are actual kind of in-universe books. And a lot of the, the Hobbit was actually written by Bilbo. A lot of the Lord of the Rings was written by Frodo, who's the main character. However, it doesn't really feel like that. If you read The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings, it doesn't really feel like the the books are actually written by the characters themselves. It feels more like a standard novel where we kind of jump around and we, we hear every character's thoughts. Like they'll occasionally talk about what Gandalf's thinking, what this other character's thinking. It's not really from Bilbo or Frodo's perspective. I mean, we get information of things that they couldn't have possibly known. They try to explain it by saying, you know, these books have been passed down from person to person and have been edited by a lot of different people. But it still just didn't really make sense. Like, it, it doesn't read like it was actually written by Frodo or Bilbo. The book is actually written as if it's an old kind of ancient history of our world. Like, these characters actually existed in our world long ago. It's just, you know, forgotten ancient history. There's a bit about how the classic nursery rhyme of the cow jumping over the moon actually originated from Frodo when he sung it at this one bar one time. Um, kind of little bits like that where they try to explain sort of how this story actually affects our world today. We'll start with the first volume here containing the first two books, The Fellowship of the Ring. And this one I definitely think was the weakest of the three here. We get the introduction of Frodo Baggins, the main character, who is the nephew of Bilbo Baggins from The Hobbit. They actually explain early in this book why there's two versions of the Gollum story in The Hobbit. Uh, they say that the version that was in the first edition is the made-up story that Bilbo initially told, and then the version in the second edition is what actually happened. I thought that was kind of a clever way to kind of have the continuity make sense um, and brought it more in line with The Hobbit. And the book kind of starts with Bilbo Baggins uh, having this great birthday celebration. And then he's planning to leave uh, the Shire to go on, you know, more adventures. But we learn that this ring that Bilbo got from Gollum is actually kind of very important. And he has to pass it down to Frodo to be the next kind of bearer of the ring. And he really does not want to because the ring kind of corrupts you to not giving it up. It's kind of an addiction almost of sorts. So then the ring is passed down to Frodo and then we get some more backstory from Gandalf that he discovered this ring is actually the uh, ring of power that was made by Sauron, who was this uh, kind of dark lord who tried to basically take over the world and was defeated. But he crafted these rings of power that have kind of made him able to stay alive because his essence is in these rings, basically. Gandalf gives Frodo this mission. He needs to take this ring to Rivendell. And yeah, we get to also meet a lot of other hobbits that Frodo is friends with, Sam, uh, Merry, and Pippin. And they join him on this adventure. Uh, so he goes with these four hobbits to Rivendell and they're constantly being chased by these Nazgul, who are the sort of uh, servants of Sauron. They're kind of these dark creatures that ride horses. Um, so, so yeah, that's the whole first book is them trying to get to Rivendell, basically. They're also joined by this character Strider, who is, we learn, is friends with Gandalf, and he's going to help them on this journey to get to Rivendell. And that's basically the first book. Um, and yeah, I felt like it was kind of, kind of boring, the whole first, first book. Um, there's a lot of points where it's just complete filler, like stuff that doesn't really have any bearing on... Uh, the story whatsoever. There's parts that were completely cut out of the film series because they don't really matter. And I feel like the first the first book kind of suffers a lot of the same problems from The Hobbit, where kind of the characters, we don't really care about them that much. They're kind of interchangeable, um, except, except Strider, who's unique. And then for the second book, we finally get to Rivendell and we have this, this council of people from lands all across Middle-earth. 
and we get this kind of uh, you know, big council where Gandalf explains all this stuff with the ring and that Sauron is attempting to, you know, take over Middle-earth and they have to decide what they want to do. They'd eventually decide to destroy the ring. So Frodo will have to venture to Mordor to throw it into Mount Doom. So we get a lot of more kind of lore during this council. He, we learn about Saruman, who's like the, the court of grand wizard of all the wizards. And he has turned evil and tried to lock up Gandalf. Uh, because he wanted to hide the fact that the ring is Sauron's ring. Yeah, I did like learning kind of a lot more about the, the lore of the world. Um, but other than that, the second half is still pretty boring. Honestly, not much happens at all until the very end. Um, yeah, I just really did not really like this book. So after this Council of Elrond, four more people join their party. There's Gandalf, uh, Boromir, who's, uh, you know, from Gondor, from the lands of Gondor. Then we get Legolas, who's an uh, an elf, and then Gimli, who's a dwarf. And then we learn that Strider is actually known as Aragorn, and he is the the heir to the throne in Gondor. So the second book is a lot more interesting because we have more characters, and we go to kind of more interesting places. We go to this mountains of Caradran or something, and then they go into the mines of Moria, which is probably the most interesting part of the book, I thought. Um... Yeah, they get overrun by a lot of goblins or orcs. A lot of the descriptions of like the orcs and of the various kind of enemies that they encounter, he's kind of vague in describing them, especially in the Mines of Moria, we come across this creature called the Balrog or the Balrog. And he's supposed to be this very menacing kind of creature. And we don't really get a lot of description of what he actually even looks like. It was I, was struggling to even picture in my head what he looked like. I did like the chapter with the Balrog where they kind of have to, Gandalf has to stay behind to fight him uh, and dies. Uh, that was that was kind of the best, the highlight of the book. But other than that, I was very bored reading this for a majority of the book. It suffers from a lot of the same problems as The Hobbit, where it's just not a lot happening, a lot of filler, very boring. Uh, the book does end on a good cliffhanger where the, kind of the party gets split up and uh you know frodo realizes he needs to leave the party uh, and go on his own and then sam comes with him eventually but um yeah i like the end but a majority of the book just straight trash i'm gonna be honest then we move on to the two towers here the second volume and fun facts the tower of sauron the baradur i believe it's called the eye of sauron that is actually not one of the two towers uh, as depicted on the cover here definitely like this book a lot better. This is probably my favorite of the three books. The party gets split up a lot because, you know, of course, at the end of the last book when Frodo and Sam left and then Merry and Pippin get kidnapped, where the first book was kind of very linear and we just follow this one journey the whole time. This book, we jump around a lot of different storylines happening at the same time uh, because the party is split up. Now, book three, we only see what Aragorn and Legolas and Gimli and, and Mary and Pippin, we get to see all what they're doing. And then the second book, book four, then we get to see what Sam and Frodo were doing the whole time. It reminded me a lot of the fourth and fifth Game of Thrones books, how they split up the characters. Um, yeah, and I, I kind of liked this a lot more, the non-linear storytelling. And I think the, the splitting up of all the characters definitely gave the characters a lot more time to shine and sort of stand out on their own. Um, yeah, Mary and Pippin, we get a lot more sort of character development of them a lot more character development of legolas and gimli as well and sam and frodo um boromir dies at the very beginning of this book boromir had become corrupted by the ring at the end of the last book and he attempted to kind of kill frodo and take the ring and that was part of the reason why frodo left decided he had to go it's meant to represent how power can corrupt people he wants to you know take the ring for himself and you know, use use its power to defeat Sauron. You also get the return of Gandalf in this book as well. He comes back as Gandalf the White. Um, that was a bit, a bit silly. The fact that he comes back to life, I believe it was meant to kind of be a, a, a sort of Jesus Christ-like resurrection. Again, it kind of cheapens Gandalf's death in the first book. And I did like what they did with Gandalf for the rest of the series. One thing I did not like about this book is saruman is really just never presented as a threat at all he doesn't do anything to make you fear him I mean, even in the first book when they explain how saruman captured gandalf i mean he didn't even really hurt gandalf at all he didn't even 
keep him locked up. He just sat him at the top of a really high tower. And, and then Gandalf just flew away. And then in this book, again, he just, Gandalf beats him in like two seconds. Um, destroys his, his staff. It was very goofy. I mean, Saruman just doesn't seem like a threat at all. It was very underwhelming. I especially like the second half where we see kind of Sam and Frodo and then uh, Gollum comes. Uh, we learn that Gollum has been following them this whole time and he finally joins them and they decide to have him lead them to the Mount Doom to destroy the ring because they don't know how to get there themselves. Um, and Gollum slowly kind of tries to turn the Frodo and Sam against each other. I thought it was very clever. Um, and then he eventually turns on them and tries to, you know, feed them to a gigantic spider. We get a lot of fun big battle scenes as well. I mean, it does still suffer from a lot of the same problems as the last book, but I did enjoy it a lot more. So now we move on to The Return of the King, the final volume. And it does kind of a similar thing to the last book where we don't see Sam and Frodo for the whole first book and then they come in later. Although in book six, the Sam and Frodo chapter, after a while, all the characters come back into fold and then we get to see, you know, all the characters together. Um, yeah, this was, again, this was definitely better than the first book. Probably not as good as the second one, I would say. Early on in this book, with Mary and Pippin split up and then Pippin becomes a servant of the king in Rohirrim and then Mary becomes a servant of the leader in Gondor. And yeah, I thought that was a pretty, pretty good idea because we get to, to learn a lot more about these two sort of nations. And then Aragorn goes on this journey through the Pass of the Dead, uh, which is sort of a, a very dangerous path that no one has come back from. And he has to recruit the, you know, these souls of the dead to help assist him in battle. And eventually they kind of take over a bunch of Corsair ships that he uses, that he sails into the final battle. And yeah, I think that was probably the highlight was that that big battle, the first battle. There's two battles in this book. But yeah, the battle in Gondor was definitely a highlight. Um, then we get to see sort of Sam and Frodo's perspective again as they destroy the ring. They destroy the ring very early on, uh, especially compared to the movies. Like you're only halfway through the volume, like around here when they actually destroy the ring. And then there's a lot more after that. But um. Yeah, as far as destroying the ring, I have a few problems with what happened. Once they get to Mount Doom, Frodo's about to destroy the ring, and then he um, changes his mind. He's been corrupted by Sauron, and he is he's not going to destroy the ring. He's going to take it for himself. Then Gollum shows up out of nowhere, bites off Frodo's finger, and then accidentally falls into Mount Doom, so the ring gets destroyed anyway. It felt very convenient, very contrived. It felt like a very lazy way to just destroy the ring without having to deal with, you know, Frodo being corrupted. I feel like at the very least, Sam and Frodo should have had to, you know, fight over the ring or they should have had to like throw Gollum in and kill him. But it feels very, just very lucky that he just grabs the ring and then happens to fall in on accident. It feels very lazy, especially because Gollum is completely absent from this volume until that chapter where they destroy the ring. So he only shows up for that one chapter and then just accidentally dies by convenience one character i liked in here is eowyn who's this um female fighter in in uh rohan and she's you know not allowed to fight because she's female but she sneaks in and fights anyway i liked her character uh she sort of be befriends mary and she helps mary sneak into the war as well so then after the ring is destroyed we see some other things that were going on during the, the time of the final battle um, we get to see Faramir's relationship with Eowyn, and then we get to see Aragorn's relationship with, uh, Arwen. And then afterwards we get this whole section that was completely cut from the movies where, you know, Frodo and his hobbit friends go back to the Shire and learn that after they left, the Shire had become a communist dictatorship. Um, I'm not joking. Yeah, I felt like I was reading Animal Farm for a second because it very clearly, like, satirizes, you know, socialism and communism. Um, but yeah, so this kind of dictator kind of took over the the Shire and then Saruman steps in and takes it over as well. Yeah, I did kind of enjoy that chapter. It was a little goofy, a little funny. And then that's how the story ends. They take the Shire back from Saruman. Saruman dies. And then we get a long appendix at the end here. And the appendix actually has a lot of useful information. 
we get a lot more backstory about you know Aragorn and Arwen's relationship that wasn't really fleshed out in the books um we get a lot of sort of insight into uh how things are pronounced as well there's a whole section on you know how uh how pronouncing different names and I realized that I had botched pretty much every name in the book I was pretty shocked by how much sort of depth there was in this appendix how much he's fleshed out this sort of world he's fleshed out like the languages and the the calendars there's a whole section on the calendar and why it has so many days in each month and it, it's incredibly detailed for like a fictional book it's, it's, it's pretty absurd but yeah overall overall yeah this is the second best one it's a it's it's a good okay read but yeah i did definitely did not enjoy the lord of the rings near as much as like song of ice and fire definitely definitely more mid-tier i would say um yeah